It's October, the only month where it's socially acceptable to wet yourself in public. When done properly, horror can be one of the most effective and affecting genres, because nothing gets you more emotionally invested in the outcome of a story than unbridled terror. Done poorly, though, horror games can be downright laughable at best and completely painful at worst, and not because of all the rusty circular saws and crazy murderers, but because playing them feels about as pleasant as pulling teeth. However, because we're gluttons for punishment here at Triple Jump, we've decided to take a trip into the bin and dig out some of the worst horror experiences the video game world has given us in the first part of the current decade. To be clear, we've based this list partially on average review scores, but there's more than a little personal opinion factored in as well. Although it's true there are loads of obscure rubbish asset flip horror games constantly getting released into the void that is Steam, they would get very boring to talk about very quickly, so we're not including any of those here. I'm Peter from Triple Jump, and here are the 10 worst horror games of the 2020s so far. Number 10. Hello Neighbor 2 The first Hello Neighbor was certainly nothing to write home about, and in fact it was featured in our Worst Games of 2017 video, so you know it was a true stinker. However, thanks to all the popularity it got on YouTube, it managed to spawn a series and eventually a proper sequel. But surely the only place to go from its disastrous first impression is up, right? Well, sort of. Is Hello Neighbor 2, critically speaking, better than the first game of the series? Yes. Does it do basically exactly the same thing as the first with little to no alteration? Also yes. Unfortunately for both it and us, the second of the games takes everything the first did and essentially copy-pastes it, making it feel more like what the prior entry should have been instead of a true sequel. Though there have been some graphical improvements and the puzzles could be worse, the clunkiness and bugs are still present, and it doesn't truly live up to either its stealth or horror potential. To cap all that off, it doesn't add anything new to the admittedly nonsensical and paper-thin plot, which only furthers the feeling that this could have just been an update or, heck, even an email. Truly, this is the worst kind of neighbour imaginable. Number 9. Uoni some of the best horror games out there are dark not only visually, but thematically as well. This is something that Uoni attempts to balance in its psychological narrative, but unfortunately it just doesn't end up working out in the slightest. Much of the story is told through prolonged series of text screens between each individual section, which is not really what someone usually wants to be greeted with when hitting start on a new game, unless it's a visual novel of course. If that isn't immediately off-putting enough, it also does basically nothing differently from myriad other similar horror titles out there, with overly simplistic gameplay and a heavy reliance on predictable jump scares and boring hide-and-seek mechanics in a series of samey, maze-like levels. Some of this could have been forgiven if other features were good enough, but the game also never bothers to do anything particularly interesting, such as add new mechanics or, you know, be scary, causing the whole thing to become an uninteresting slog. With a few tweaks, you only could have likely stood out a little bit more from all of its competition. However, with nothing to differentiate itself and a story that most people will speed read at best, it falls far too short to be worth anyone's time. Number 8. Deadly Premonition 2 – A Blessing in Disguise Anyone who's familiar with the first Deadly Premonition knows it was an absolute mess of a game, and even those people who love it, despite all of its many flaws, I think secretly know that it's objectively quite bad. I say all of that so that when I tell you the sequel is even worse in multiple ways, you know just what level of horrible we are talking about here. It's hard to get worse than bad, but clearly it's not impossible. Granted though, the charming quirkiness of the original is still present in many ways, with a host of eccentric characters and plenty of bizarre situations for the player to navigate through. 
One of the biggest issues facing Deadly Premonition 2, though, is that it's technically speaking a complete shambles, with horrible draw distances and frame rates that frequently drop through the floor, despite not being the most graphically strenuous game in the first place. In addition to that, the open world feels more lifeless than before, and even the fighting is duller than the bare-bones combat of its predecessor. Some fans of the original are sure to get everything they want out of this game, but when you divide an audience of an already divisive cult classic, it's going to be a hard sell for anyone else. Number 7. Those Who Remain Overall atmosphere can very often make or break a horror game too in your face and it lessens the effectiveness, but too muddy, obscured, or generally dark, and no one can even see the spooks well enough to get scared by them. This, at least, is something that Those Who Remain manages to get mostly right, with some unsettling moments, freakish shifting scenery, and occasional heavy decisions for the player to make. There are also some decently clever puzzles, which help to break up the gameplay a bit and prevent the title from just being a jump-scare-laden walking simulator. Unfortunately, though, that's about all the good things there are to say about Those Who Remain because it suffers from poor controls and a general lack of polish, and leads up to a conclusion that never manages to quite pay off. The stealth simply doesn't feel good enough either, and though the atmosphere is decent, it still doesn't quite manage to feel survival horror enough. There are also some occasional bugs that pop up and make it impossible to progress even after reloading, causing it to feel more like a waste of time than a satisfying horror experience. Huh, those who remain, more like th those who never sh should have come here in the first place if they knew what was good for them. No, I guess that would be too long to fit onto the store listing, wouldn't it? Number 6. Saint Kotar We come now to a game that's a bit of an exception to the norm, because were you to look at Steam only, you'd be forgiven for thinking that Saint Kotar isn't all that bad. It's nicely presented and has some decent puzzles that are perfect for the point-and-click nature of the gameplay. That's not to say it's completely flawless, as the characters aren't in any hurry to get around and sometimes the story can be a bit convoluted and clunky, but as a PC game, it isn't all that bad, if not anything overly remarkable. The main problem with Saint Kotar, then, comes from it being ported to consoles with seemingly no care or adjustment to make the experience smooth or fun for people playing with a controller, making the whole thing far more frustrating than anything else. This does nothing but drag the game down, meaning that anything that worked in its favour or was at least forgivable on the PC version is overshadowed by just how much of a pain it is to get working properly on console, and even the compelling mysteries and characters can't make up for that. It's always nice when games get a chance to be appreciated by a different audience, so porting is often a good idea, but if it's done this poorly, it probably would have been better not to even bother. Number 5. Evil Inside they say that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, but with how much imitation PT has gotten over the years and how little of said imitation has been good, flattery or not, copycatting isn't always a good thing. Evil Inside is one of the worst offenders of this particular rip-off phenomenon, stripping everything out of the PT experience and leaving players with an endless trudge through boring and predictable scares, all while supposedly telling a story that couldn't be more forgettable if it tried. Perhaps one of the worst things about it is its laughably short runtime. Admittedly, that's something else it technically inherited from PT, but as that was a demo, at least PT had an excuse. For this game, though, assuming you don't just stand still in the looping hallway for a while to admire the architecture, the whole thing will likely take just under an hour. This could potentially be forgiven if there was any actual replay value, but there is literally none, as assuming you've made it to the credits, you'll have unlocked all the trophies, and so there's nothing that justifies going back in again. Unless it's the only horror game you own, or you hate good things, I guess. Then by all means, have at it. Number 4. Quantum Error There have been plenty of times where a game has fallen far short of its ambitions 
problems. Whether this is due to lack of funding, lack of experience, or lack of resources, it's hard to tell how many less than stellar games could have been something great if they were given the right opportunities. That is very much true of Quantum Error, whose lofty ideals for a cosmic horror infused shooter were let down at pretty much every turn. Bad controls, bland gameplay, and poor performance are apparent throughout. On top of that, the story and cutscenes are atrocious, and the strange mix of shooter, horror, and firefighter simulator means that not a single aspect of gameplay was developed enough in its own right to be competent. And even if it had, it still would have been let down by the generic enemies and encounters. Add to all of this the fact it was priced at a full $60, and it's no surprise that few people were willing to give it the time of day. The real error here, of course, is that it was ever allowed to be sold in such a state in the first place, but that seems to be the norm more often than not these days, so we can barely even single it out for that. <laughs> Don't you just love modern gaming? Number 3. Remothered Broken Porcelain it's time for another sequel this time around, but unlike the other first outings we've seen previously, Remothered Tormented Fathers actually fared quite well with critics. Its sequel, on the other hand, well, let's just say it wasn't just the titular porcelain that was broken. The story is at least picked up from the previous title and ties up some of the plot points in a satisfying way, and even the setting of the Ashman Inn is effectively spooky for the most part. The mechanics aren't always the best, the pacing is a bit off, and the enemies end up being more annoying than scary, but those wouldn't necessarily be deal breakers. Once again, however, what could have been a silly little bit of fun for genre fans was marred by far too many bugs. And no, I'm not talking about protagonist Jennifer's moth-related abilities. Players often found they'd get stuck in the environment or that enemies would spot them through walls and around corners. Combined with controls that were tricky to deal with even when the game was running smoothly, and the whole thing would often become downright unplayable. It likely wouldn't have been a masterpiece without the bugs, but they certainly ended up being the final nail in the coffin. At least actual broken porcelain can be fixed with superglue. This game, on the other hand, didn't have a hope. Number 2. Greyhill Incident There have been more than a few sci-fi horror titles throughout the years, but despite them consistently being popular, there are very few that tap into the specific fear of UFOs full of little green men coming down to abduct cows and probers in places they shouldn't. This is something Greyhill Incident tried to change when it came along, being one of the few games outside of Destroy All Humans to feature the stereotypical space-dwelling visitors and hoping to turn them into an intimidating force to be reckoned with. Did this attempt at classic alien horror work? Well, no, obviously, because it's in this list. In fact, most facets of Greyhill Incident didn't work, and what players ended up with was a boring, empty world, frustrating gameplay loop, and an uninspired story making the whole thing feel more like a concept that was still on the drawing board than one that was meant to be a finished product. Even if the atmosphere could be effective at times and the initial setup was reasonably tense, it was never enough to distract from the fact that there just wasn't much going on. In fact, the best thing to be said about it is that it doesn't overstay its welcome, as it's quite short. It's good to know that the aliens at least won't make us suffer for too long. And number 1. Stray Souls even the most broken of games will have a dedicated group of people willing to defend it, whether due to nostalgia or boundless misplaced optimism. Our last entry, though, manages to be difficult for anyone to love, including, seemingly, the developers, judging by how little care they actually put into it. Stray Souls has it all, and I mean that in the worst possible way. A nonsensical story that's told with horrendous dialogue, boring, rubbish gameplay, uninspired environment design, technical issues that constantly make it a pain to play, and generic tropey horror that falls so flat it can't 
even be played for laughs. It's certainly nowhere near the level of quality the Silent Hill inspiration would suggest, unless of course they were talking specifically about the more recent ones. I mean, that would certainly explain a lot. Probably the only good thing that could be said about Stray Souls is that it isn't the worst looking game ever, but there's only so much that paint can do for a mouldy, crumbling facade. All of the games we've seen today have been bad, but most of them could still be entertaining with the right environment or expectations. Stray Souls, though, is something that's best left well alone, and if you're thinking of playing any of these games for Halloween this year, I can assure you that this one is all trick and no treat.